this is this is this is We have a surprise guest, Josh. You're here, but um, I uh, I've been talking to Sean and Sean Devine, everybody, and I just was like, hey, let's get let's get in on this podcast before you guys do your show with Teenage Bottle Rocket, and I'm going to release this episode one day early so that it comes out the day of the show. Oh, nice. Yeah, I was asking him about that. I was like, Mike's podcast comes out on Mondays. You're very smart. Very smart. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's get going. Um, I, I thought we'd talk about the Kitsap music scene, the punk rock scene. I realized, you know, when I was talking to Ray uh, a couple weeks ago, that I didn't know even as much as him about some parts of the punk scene in Kitsap. Because, you know, once we started touring, we were just gone. And, yeah. and I know Brain Sick probably came out. I knew about you guys, but I didn't see all the progress that you guys had made and all the touring that you had done. So I'd love to, maybe we start there, but let's get in, you know, we'll talk all about Radical Leftovers and and the show and all that, so. Yeah. But, Sounds great. Yeah. What, when you think about punk rock and our local scene, what do you, what, what comes to mind the first thing? Honestly, you guys and Jack Trippers are the first thing that pops into my head <laughs> when I hear that quote, because I was like, my first punk show. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. At the where at the Boy Scout Hall, Boy Scout Hall, Jackson Hall, in Silverdale, Washington. Yeah, because I, I I knew what punk rock was, but I didn't know that it was happening two miles down Buckland Hill from my house. You know, so it was kind of shocking. So that's the first thing that kind of pops into my head. I don't know about Sean, but well, for me, I've actually been thinking about this lately, and I have officially dubbed Bremerton the Kevin Bacon of punk rock. So you've heard the six degrees of separation. Yeah. You don't have to search that hard with bands across the country to find a connection to Bremerton. And this show with Teenage Bottle Rocket is a great example. Um, You know, we have connections with Ray and Brandon going back to their original band with Homeless Wonders. Talking to uh, Mike Moen earlier today. Turns out one of the bands on this tour that's coming to town, Shock Troopers, covers a Neutral Boy song. That's right. He he mentioned that to me. (laughs) I I did not know that. Uh, Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, MXPX, uh, Moss Generator, Art Gillette. We've got Artemis Maximus, Teenage Bottle Rocket, covers an Artemis Maximus song. So... Bremerton to me is officially the Kevin Bacon of punk rock. Yeah. I mean, you know, since I'll play too, um, I don't think of MXPX, let me, for the record, when I think of our local scene, I do think of myself often, but, uh, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, you know, I think about like bad juju that really got me started. So obviously, you know, Jason still goes by lumpy, right? Yeah. I didn't think I've ever called him Jason. Ever. <laughs> yeah. So he's playing guitar, which is a waste. I know you're, you're bass and singing, so that's cool, Sean. But Lumpy is the first bass player I, I ever really saw with my own eyes. With my own eyes. And, yeah. and so those are the bad juju days. And that really inspired me to realize, oh, you, you don't have to like have permission to play punk rock. You can just go and start your own band, you yeah, know? Yeah. And so that really, I, I would say bad juju is a huge, one of the main reasons why MX peaks exists period. Why, why I do music. I wanted to do music already. So I discovered them. I was already interested in music, but who knows what direction I might've taken, you know? Yeah. So I think about that. Uh, they made their way bad juju as a band, you know, playing all around locally a lot of parties, a lot of punk parties. The first time I, I saw 1230 Dreamtime was, uh, you know, one of those parties they were playing. And I was there because of Bad Juju. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that was out in Gorst area, Port Orchardy Gorst. Probably at the Haslip's house or something? Probably, which I didn't know them at the time. I, I saw I saw, um, I saw, saw Mikey Haslip's band. What were they called back then? They, Jesus Fish? Jesus Fish? Yeah. No, no. Was it? It that might have been. Or the Clevelands. It wasn't the Clevelands, okay. but he was on drums, and they covered Orange Crush by R.E.M. And that was like, I knew, you know, I knew that record. I, yeah, mean, yeah. I knew that, that whole record front and back. And so, like, to, and that was my favorite song. And so they did that, and I was like, what? 
okay, this is strange, you know, <laughs> but I loved it. And, and that sort of just like, imp- you know, left an impression on me, just the whole show, you know, just seeing all these punkers skating on ramps outside in the dark. And there was, I think there was like black label beer. Is that the right, the right? Lucky Lager. Well, there is. Well, that, there was there Lucky Lager, but there was a brand back in the day that it was like some black label. It was like or, a, a red can with a black label on it. Right? Something like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 We got that at the Tracyton. <laughs> they didn't have it in Bremerton at the time. So <laughs> I was like, whoa. No, uh, this is before I drank beer. I mean, I technically, I, I, you know, without going into my first drinking story, Lucky Lager was the first beer I ever drank. I was in say i was in like seventh grade or something like that anyway huh. <laughs> well like you're saying i think uh like a lot of these bands that we're talking about yeah that are institutions in this town lucky lager was sort of an institution in kitsap county for the underage drinking scene why is that i think it was cheap it, it was cheap. cheap okay yeah <laughs> so now that's like pbr or something yeah now. yeah yeah and back in those days you could go up on i want to say first ave there was a place where you could get um, fake IDs. I have it it's still it, in my wallet. Yeah, right now. so you know Montana, Wyoming state ID, total McLovin style. Yeah, yeah. So you know it was <laughs> the simpler times. Very, very much so. <laughs> I love it. So I, I think it was yeah, it was just accessibility to it. It was like easy to get. Yeah, yeah. And not a you know like nine bucks for a, a case or something. Hence though. probably why the, the the scene was so crazy back in those days is is you couldn't really do shows. There wasn't a lot of venues you could do all ages shows at. So it was usually a bar show, especially in the Seattle area. But if we're just keeping it local, Kitsap, still same thing. There was bar shows. There was, uh, although I was too young to even really want to go to shows, there was the East Side Tavern, right? Yeah. Um, I just remember Sunny Slope Range, Bad Juju, uh, fight for change, and I can't remember who else was on the show. Maybe a, a few other, a few other. Possibly you. Maybe I mean I remember the uh, the twelve thirty Dreamtime Bad Juju show. I want to say it was at the Genie Wright Elementary School. If I remember. Oh wow, if in I Silverdale. Remember, I, I believe so. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, Sunny Slope Grain Grange, um, obviously Jackson Hall. But in terms of like memories of of the Kitsap punk scene, mm-hmm. yeah, it was all about. Seeing if you could scrap to gut together the cash to pay the deposit, the, the security deposit on the place, pull together some type of PA, and see who you could get to play the show, and make a flyer. And those days, you'd go around and staple mm-hmm. them to light poles. And you know the beautiful thing about being that age and putting on these shows was you could always count on a hundred plus young, enthusiastic music fans to come get rowdy and just have a great time with you. And for me, that's a big part of my memories of the Kitsap music scene from back in those days. Yeah. My, mine's pretty much the same as yours. Like you saw Bad Juju and then you saw them play this, with this other band. They played a song that you knew and it was like, whoa, this is crazy. You know, and like that was kind of the same mentality I yeah. had. It was like, and then, you know, it's funny, like that, that show, Endless Descent played that show also, which, uh, I think this was before, like right after Tom left Endless Descent. And uh, I just became friends with all those. Everyone that was at that show, for the most part, is like. Which show are you talking about? That one at the Jackson Hall I went to that you guys oh, played and okay. uh, Endless Descent and Jack Trippers. and Somebody all, broke the bathroom sink that night and we had to pay like, I don't know, 150 bucks or something. I, I totally remember that, actually. Yeah. I, I think I know who did it, too. I don't want to throw him under the bus. Uh, but uh, he was in the Jack Trippers at one point. I think I know who it was. Um, Where's my two dollars? I had one guess. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was just like this instantaneous, like, I'm in this music scene now. Yeah. Like, like just this like is, that. I found my place. Exactly. Yeah, That's exactly I, how I felt, and I just, like, immersed myself. That's how I felt. I, I live right down the street from Lumpy, and I knew – Ben Reed at the time, he was the the um, guitar player, the first guitar player of Bad Juju. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was like, come on down. Yeah, just watch practice. You know, we're practicing from whatever to whatever. And rode my BMX down there. And I was, uh, I was in junior high. I was in junior high for sure. So, like, old enough to kind of, like, start getting into, like, being on your own and, and doing things. So, go down there. Um, and it was like these are the 
these are the big kids, you know, like this is, this is what's going on. This is, it, it was, like I said, inspiring is probably the easiest word to describe, but I was a wide eyed, just little kid just watching, you know, I, I remember going to Lumpy's house and they had a show in his backyard. So it was like maybe a year or maybe uh, everything happens so quickly when you're young. So it's probably the same year, just yeah. months later, um, the right things played, you know? And so it was like my first time seeing the right things. And to me, it was like, Oh, these guys, this is, these are the professional bands of Kitsap County. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and they were, they were good. So, so it was cool to like just see more and more. But the thing that really sticks out about Sunny Slope Grange, it was going to that bad juju show. I don't know if you'll, you, you might have heard about this if you weren't there, but a fight broke out before bad juju. No, actually, bad juju was like on stage because I remember seeing them play. But um, a fight broke out because somebody, there was like a bunch of like Nazi, neo-Nazi type skinhead dudes or wanna, probably wannabes now that I think about it. Uh, but they were harassing this Filipino guy or something like that. Well, I mean. And then a huge fight broke out. Do you? I have the full skinny on that. I See, to me, I was there. I saw the whole thing. But so many years later, I don't know what's true and what's not. You know, our memories can yeah, yeah. warp after a while. So I'd love to hear your take on that. Okay. I got to tell you this. So <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> Brain Sick put on this show. Okay. And this was, you know, I want to say 93. And at that time, there was just a huge groundswell of support and excitement within the kids out punk scene and th there were hundreds of kids hundreds of people there for this show and so i'm working the door and i'm not going to drop the names of the skinheads i don't want to say they were wannabes they were pretty entrenched in the punk scene and you know just to backtrack for a quick second we're talking about you know these fond memories and how fun it was it was also kind of scary uh like for me going to natasha's a couple of my very first shows You'd be out in the parking lot, and there was a house up on the hill, and you could hear this loud, you know, screaming and partying. Wouldn't be long before all the skinheads who lived there were down in the parking lot, you know, stirring up a cloud of dust, pre-funking. And as a 14 or 15-year-old, that was pretty intimidating. So you fast, yeah. forward, fast forward a couple years to Sunny Slope, and they show up. And right out of the gates, they, they're trying to get in. They don't got money. Um, I see one of them's got... Uh, army knife, you know, and the scabbard on the side of their pants. And I'm telling them, I want them to keep the peace. So I'm like, you can come in, don't cause any trouble. And that lasted about five minutes. And yeah, the Filipino friend that you're talking about was one of my closest friends, Bobby Day. And that's right. Yeah. Okay. They, they picked right. him out and they, they started a fight. And so, you know, brain sick at the, at the time we were knuckle sandwich. Okay, that's why, yeah. And, I remember Nickel Sandwich for sure. Yeah, and this sort okay. of this ties into our whole story, how we came to know uh, Homeless Wonders and, and Ray and Brandon from Teenage Bottle Rocket. But we're watching our friend get in a fight and trying to decide, do we intervene and risk the whole show or do we let this thing play out? And we intervened. <laughs> Hell yeah, we intervened. And by the end, you know, the guys in Brain Sick... Uh, knuckle sandwich at the time they're a little bit older they're from southern california they'd been been through some pretty serious punk scene um you know um upbringing and this wasn't their first rodeo and you know at one point skinhead's getting drugged across the parking lot by his uh suspenders while our bass player at that time has that guy's knife and is slicing at, it at him and you know what we we ran him out of that show and uh, you know sadly the show didn't happen but you know, at that time, uh, that skinhead activity, uh, it kind of, that we had a couple of run-ins with them and, you know, we kind of ran them out of town, but we also decided, we kind of realized meth was kind of taking, you know, taking hold here in Kitsap at that time. And that's part of why Knuckle Sandwich, we decided to relocate and we moved to, to Bellingham because we just, you know, after a couple run-ins, these guys had moved up from California to try to get away from that. And that's when we ended up relocating to Bellingham, eventually got signed to a local label, Ransom Note. There's a, you know, kind of a well-known uh, old school punk band out of California called Knuckle Sandwich. And that's how we, we changed our name to Knuckle Sandwich. From? From to Brain Sick. I'm sorry, to Brain Sick. Yeah. And then uh, when we ended up putting out our full length, we, as a sort of ode to those days, called it Knuckle Sandwich and wrote a song 
called Knuckle Sandwich about that night, about Whoa. that fight, um, yeah. about the things that happened that led us to relocate. And, you know, I'm back now. I've been here for a while, and I'm, I love it here in Bremerton. I'm happy to be here. But, you know, like any scene, it goes through ebbs and flows. It, mm-hmm. it, go, it changes with the times. And, you know, there was a time when it was dangerous and scary. There was a time when uh, shows were packed and, and everybody was coming. And there's a time now when we're all older and, and, you know, have different variations of our bands. But what's cool is a lot of us are still doing it. And that's what I was saying earlier is those ties run deep. Those ties run through so many different bands. Those ties run across the country from all the different bands from around here who've traveled, met other bands, made connections, and kept doing it. So to, to, to get a band like Teenage Bottle Rocket to come to Bremerton to celebrate those connections, to celebrate the life of Brandon, uh, Ray's brother, is cool. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it means everything to me, and I just, you know, I'm excited and, I, and thrilled, and I couldn't be more happy to you know, be a part of that. Yeah. And that brings us to the new band radical leftovers. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's cool to see you guys back doing something. Obviously it's like, let's just do something for fun. Let's, let's make some tunes that make people's hair stand up, you know? And and it's, it's, it's got some, some oomph to it. I like it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. So how do you guys, so, (laughs) I mean, I don't want to be cliche and be like, how'd you guys get together? But I mean, what was the, uh, what was the catalyst and, and how do you guys, actually write the songs um the catalyst was me and sean i, I think i booked a brain sick at the manette like 10 years ago or something with neutral boy and we just we didn't really know each other back in the day too much mm-hmm. and so i was just kind of booking brain sick a couple shows and we just kind of became buddies that way and uh eventually he moved back over here like he said and him and Kelly were trying to, you know, start a new band to have a place to practice. And eventually Kelly built a practice space and he just randomly hit me up. I was like, Hey, I got like years late, like a couple years later after we jammed once in his basement. And he's like, Hey, I got, we got the practice space now. Let's, let's do the band. And I was like, Oh, okay, sure. I'll, yeah. be, I'll be there. And so I, I was like, he heard me play guitar like once, I think. And I was like, you sure I can do this. Cause I didn't really play guitar. Yeah. You didn't, right. Yeah, you just started in your adulthood. Oh yeah, that's kind of weird. It's kind yeah. of cool. I mean, um, not not often does that happen. Well, I was playing. I played bass in a band uh, when I was in the nine mid nineties, and then I sang in a band in the late nineties. Yeah, and then I started putting on shows full time. So I didn't play anything at all, but I'd see people playing multiple times a week booking shows, and I was like. I think I could do that. And I, that's seriously <laughs> yeah. how I learned 99% of what I can play on guitar. That's what I like, think when I see people skateboarding. And then you, <laughs> then you eat shit. <laughs> yeah. That's a little different, but uh, a little different, but now that's I cool. I see what you're saying. But you have the practice space. I mean, that's maybe that's part of it is like, what are you even going to do if you don't have a place to do it? Yeah. Yeah. Consistent. Yeah. yeah consistently. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of what happened. And uh, Sean, he already had uh, some songs written. So we just kind of started with those. And, uh, yeah, no. Yeah. Um, f- for me, half a brain sick lives in Bellingham. And so we've tried to keep it together. We're still a band and, you know, we just play shows when it feels right. And when there's an opportunity, but we were meeting in Bellevue at evolution studios and it's a great place, but it, it's just hard. And yeah, yeah. I just really have always wanted to just have a band for me. It's the creative outlet. It's, it's what I do for fun. And the biggest hang up was having a jam room and, you know, living in Manette back in the, in those days in an old, you know, 1940s uh, house in the basement. And it's, you know, shaking the rafters and the whole neighborhood is listening and, and it just was hard to do. And um, once Kelly, the drummer who was the drummer from brain sick, Pascal, once he bought this property and had the workshop, it was a slam dunk. We built the jam room, and then it was a matter of, okay, well, who do we want to play music with? And Josh instantly came to mind because we were becoming friends. He posted on social media that, hey, I, you know, I, I'm, I can play some guitar. <laughs> and, you know, I've always been the singer and the front man, and I just was wanting to challenge myself a little bit and, yeah. and pick up the bass. And I've always played, but I never really had the motivation to get better and work on it. And so I just decided I wanted to try to, you know, play bass and sing and, and work on writing songs, not from a lyrical standpoint, but also from a melody and from a rhythmic standpoint. 
And so that was a lot of my motivation. And so the three of us were jamming and just having a good time. This was all right before the pandemic. And then Lumpy, um, who, again, we've, we spent a lot of time talking about Lumpy and well-deserved. He is a uh, virtue, virtue. He has virtuosity on the bass. He can run that mm -hmm. neck up and down with his eyes closed and hit every note and, and rip out amazing fills and leads without even thinking about it. So to be playing bass in a band with him, you know, <laughs> I can only imagine, you know, yeah, it's a little intimidating, but he also coaches me. Um, but I knew that he could play guitar because one of these random jam sessions we had was with him on guitar. And so when he left head honcho, cause same deal commuting to Seattle, you know, kids, it's just hard to sustain. You, you want to have something local. Mm -hmm. I said, Hey man, you want to, you want to come play guitar? I mean, this band's a little different. We're trying to, um, I mean, the music is the same in a way it's got the same nineties skate punk vibe, which is really what we're trying to do. Yeah. Um, but do you want to come play guitar? And you know what? I'll be damned if that guy shouldn't have had a six string bass all along because he's ripping, uh, those six strings on the guitar. Um, just as good. I mean, he might not say that as he does on the bass, but you know, he, he can bust out a lead. Um, and it sounds pretty good first try. And you know, he's a great musician. He's got a great ear and, um, it just sort of came together at the early stages of the, of the pandemic. And we had two years during the pandemic to kind of work on the songs and, and refine things. And, um, you know, we were able to record a demo with, uh, um, 321 studios here with some local guys. And so as things started to open up, um, we were ready to go. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, there's a funny story about Lumpy. Uh, when I was at a bad juju practice back in the day, didn't know anything about music really yet. You know, it was just like watching and Lumpy goes, check it out. This is how you write a song. Come up with a part. Do, 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 do. And then you just reverse it for the next part. Do, 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 I'm like, okay. So I tried that and it totally worked. Oh yeah. Got those same notes. They fit together. You know. Yeah, there's there's a bass line he played that I was just like, it's so simple. And that maybe maybe I took that to heart too, you know, just just watching him and absorbing the fact that he was taking very, very simple things and making it really catchy. And yeah, I, I I definitely that made an impact on me somehow. Even though I wasn't even playing yet, I was I was just maybe maybe i started right after that kind of thing and like pretty I, it close. probably planted a seed in your head like oh this is doable like I yeah i can do this you yeah know? and that's the way like that music was to me too you know it's like well i had ryan elke showing me basically the same exact thing mm -hmm. he was just like just do this and do this and then play it backwards and or or just <laughs> or go to the second from the last note and start the next riff you know yeah it's just like lumpy but, school of songwriting yeah yeah yeah, but you know, Lumpy, I mean, and it's cool. I mean, and he's one of of, a, of many people in Kitsap like that. Mm -hmm. Tony Reed, yeah. the Haslip brothers, you know, they've been in so many bands. They've, um, you know, influenced so many people and helped elevate the game here in Kitsap. And yeah, yeah. I think it's just sort of, uh, you know, it all feeds upon itself. And it just has been, you know, this is a blue collar um, you know, shipyard working class town. And it just is conducive to writing and playing really fun, really, you know, meat and potatoes in the pocket, rock and roll, punk rock. It's mm -hmm. this town is just perfect for it. I think so too. I mean, it, it like you say, it, it ebbs and flows and, you know, there's a lot of history. Um, but where are we at today? What do you guys, what do you guys seen? I mean, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of positivity. I'm seeing a lot of people happy to be out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the bands are, are like, there's a spark and, and the flame is growing. I, I feel like that, but. I agree. Yeah. I mean, um, it's definitely, I still feel like it's the bottom of the. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're still at the, we're still low, but we're, we're on our way back up. Well, I mean, like when I really started putting on shows, I'm, I'm pretty used to having, 300 kids at a show that's that's what i think of as a show because when i first started really doing shows it was like there wasn't less than 200 kids ever it was like always this massive audience and then like i stopped doing all ages shows because a lot of those bands that were drawing those crowds i like, kind of broke up moved to seattle or whatever you know mm -hmm. and uh i kind of 
not reverted, but I went to booking bar shows instead of all ages shows just because well, I was getting old too. And it's kind of weird having. As you spend yeah. time in the bar, yeah, might yeah. as well book bar shows. Exactly. <laughs> so I started doing that and I just kind of uh, felt like there's not a lot of music fans in the area. There's a lot of people that are playing in bands that are fans of the other bands. But like I said, I came from a time where there was a huge audience that were just fans mm -hmm. and just wanted to be a part of the, the scene, not really playing bands or whatever, you know. So it's kind of weird to me now. It's like there's a lot of support from so there's like I was saying earlier, there's not a lot of kid bands. There's very few. There's like two or three and there's one or two of members in each one of those bands that's in the other couple bands, you know, so there's not a huge all ages scene. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the energy comes from. And that's where the growth comes from, because we're all old, you know, like we could still go out and have fun and do cool shows and stuff. But I think you need that youth energy to build up the scene and make it a big thing, you know, and uh, but getting bands like Teenage Bottle Rocket to come to town, doing their only all ages show in the Northwest for this Bremerton show. Um, it's going to pull a lot of kids in, I think. And they go, oh, we can get cool bands here. And then, you know, maybe they'll connect them to us that connects them to Sailing Camp and a couple other kid bands. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, there's other kids our age that are... That's my whole kind of thought pattern is like, maybe if I start bringing bigger bands to town, it'll bring more kids to those shows mm -hmm. and realize there's a local scene here too that they can be involved in even more so than you know, with a national band or something, you know, so. Yeah. And I mean, Bremerton obviously just being unique because it's, it's not an Island, but everybody thinks it is, you know, in the ferry system and it's great to have shows here. So people don't have to worry about, you know, how am I going to catch the next ferry home? You know, 10 30s, the, you know, and then 12, 10 or 12 50 or whatever it is. That's becoming sketchier and sketchier. Yeah, going yeah. to Seattle. I hate to disparage Seattle because I mean, I grew up going to shows in Seattle, yeah. but. Yeah, it is. They can a, come over here. Yeah, yeah, just come on over. Uh, <laughs> yeah, or the fear of getting stuck over there and yeah. having to get a hotel or something, you know. Oh, a, hotel. I mean, I believe me, I've had my share of nights on the uh, park benches at Occidental Park because you missed the 1250 boat, you know, at 15 and 16, and you're spending the night at your friend's house, but you mm. went to a punk show in Seattle, <laughs> and you're, you know, you're shivering your balls off through the night waiting for that four- 20 or 450 boat to get home and sneak back into the your friend's house before mom and dad realized you never actually came home. Those are true stories. What what show was it that that happened? Can you remember? Um yeah, it was um all at OK Hotel. I went to that sh I mean if unless they played there a bunch of times, was it the Percolator tour? Um I don't remember, but it was the same show. It had or, to be uh, the same show. Was did Seaweed play that one? Uh definitely my name played. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're big just, drill car. Yeah. So we're just having too much fun yeah. and roaming the streets <laughs> and missed the last ferry and mm. toughed it out on the park bench. Crazy. I <laughs> felt like that was literally my first like real punk show aside from, you know, bad juju shows and stuff in, in Kitsap. And so the next day at school, I was in junior high, I was in ninth grade or was I in ninth grade? Maybe I was in eighth grade at the time, but I was definitely in junior high. And I think... I think it might have been eighth grade because there was like an older kid, you know, this older girl that was at the show and she saw me and I was like, yeah, she thinks I'm cool. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know just like, but it's kind of like that feeling is like, oh, if you know, you know, because it's like, oh, I didn't know that you liked punk rock. And now I do because you were like, who just shows up at the OK Hotel? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't you know? random. No, not at all. So yeah, that was my first my first real show, and I'm pretty sure Aaron, my buddy Aaron Coleman at the time, me and him were both into The Descendants, and so, and Joe Coleman, his his older brother yeah. Joe Coleman, was, he yeah. was in bands. Yeah, he was at my grade. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So he, you know, we we were kind of like discovering punk rock a little bit here and there, and and Descendants were one of our favorites, and all I got this all tape, and it, and it was. I guess it was percolator no it wasn't percolator it was um it was um the one before that anyway i'm <laughs> spacing out but uh i didn't know you know it sounded like this out of control album like i'd never heard any music like it yeah well all i had a band crush on all in yeah. uh, junior high and high school and talking about those connections mm -hmm. uh all's second singer scott reynolds 
Yeah. And descendant, and you know, the goodbye member, Harry, right? Yeah. I mean, they have a connection to Kitsap. Moen got hooked up with those guys um, when they played here at Natasha's and ends up being a roadie with them. Scott Reynolds marries a local girl. And again, uh, Kitsap County is the Kevin Bacon of punk rock. It's yeah. Just, it's, yeah. It's decided. It's true. I mean, GBH <laughs> played Bremerton. I'm pretty. I didn't. Oh, I wasn't there. Yeah. But Green Day, I heard played what Seabeck. Yeah, yeah. Just out by that uh, little army base kind of thing that's <laughs> along the highway there. Oh yeah, yeah, good, yeah. Good riddance. Uh, this is another classic story. I wasn't at the show, but Good Riddance. Uh, those guys uh, played some random show in Kingston. Um, Brainsick played um, some shows with Good Riddance, uh, and so it kind of became friends with those guys. And uh, yeah, six degrees of separation. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I can even go further beyond 90s punk into like early 2000s, like alternative and screamo bands. Yeah. Like I was going. booking a lot <laughs> of uh, bands in those days that were, have since become very gigantic bands like Portugal, the man mm -hmm. who like just won a Grammy two years ago. They played right here, you know, at yeah. the disabled veterans hall and which is weird. And uh, like, um, just a uh, plain white tees played at the coffee oasis, which is the size of this room yes, essentially. Right. So, so, um, a lot of those connections, I mean, that's why I had that connection to their teenage bottle rockets agent mm -hmm. is because of past shows that I'd booked through their agency years and years and years ago. So I'm in there. They're like, what'd you call it? The other, the B market, like uh, <laughs> Rolodex. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm in the Bremerton B market Rolodex. So if they need a, an off date show, like on a Sunday or a Monday or something, and they're in Seattle and Tacoma on those other days, the weekend nights, um, I get hit up and sometimes it's like, eh, I don't think that show will really work. Sometimes it's like, I think this one will work. So I'll, I'll take it, you know? And, um, yeah. Sunday shows. I think, you know, people in Kitsap got a, they got a, prepare themselves for more shows on Sunday, at least touring acts, because, you know, if they're, if they're in Portland or if they're in Seattle, they don't want to give up, you know, a weekend, uh, Friday, Saturday in Bremerton, you know, uh, they usually want to go somewhere where there's a bigger venue or something like that. But I mean, that's, we could turn that around, you know, uh, because Bremerton be, could become the, the, a market. the A market. Exactly. And I was, when you were talking to Ray, I was thinking that exact same thing. I'm like, I guarantee you, the show that's at the Redwood Tracing Movie House is going to be way cooler than their Tractor Tavern show. I guarantee it. Like, it's the all-ages show. It's Bremerton. People go a little... I don't know. We're not starved for the entertainment here, obviously. But it's just a little more exciting here, mm -hmm. in my opinion, compared to Seattle shows. And back in the day, like in the early 2000s, I would get touring bands that would rather play their B market date in mm -hmm. Seattle and play their, their Friday or Saturday in Bremerton. Cause kids were going to go off, you know, there's yeah. a, an energy here. And I've always felt that it's just, it's on kind of a, a lull right now, but I think this show can honestly do a lot to revive that, you know, and mm -hmm. pump some energy into the local uh, music scene. Kind of. Yeah. I the plan. I encourage everybody come on out tonight. If you're listening to this, and the day it comes out. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's it's funny because Seattle or any kind of major market, it's, it's there's a show every day, every night of the week, mm. you know, and especially like a, a Tractor Tavern, there's a, you know, one night it's like a Dolly Parton style show, another night it's maybe more punk, but they don't really have a lot of punk shows there. So no, I thought it's a that little... Was strange i mean odd that it, they were having it there but. maybe their branch maybe the track the tractor is branching out you know and, and trying to book more punky stuff but you know there's there's definitely a plethora of good venues for punk shows in seattle yeah now yeah. in bremerton it, it's much more limited which actually kind of makes things easier as long as you have like a few staples but um the Minette's kind of coming back it, it was gone for a while obviously with with covid and everything in, in the pandemic but but now, you know, seeing shows over there, it's it's been cool. Yeah. I just came from there right now, actually. Becky and uh, Eric said to say hi. And uh, Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm booking a few shows there, too. Good. And uh, just, uh, you know, trying to dig my claws back into it and do as much as I can. So as, an, as a, are you a talent buyer or are you a promoter? Is that, there's two different, that's two different things, right? Yeah, but you know, I do both, but mm. I don't, I like the term talent buyer. Talent buyer. <laughs> it's, I don't know. The promoter has like a lot of sleazy eighties 
connotation, you know, like the hair metal scene, getting ripped off, ripping off bands and stuff. And I definitely don't rip yeah. off bands. And uh, so I don't know. There's just like a lot of negative connotation that goes along with the the term promoter. So I like talent buyer. Same with like a band manager has a bad connotation, like sleazy manager. Yeah, type. yeah, yeah. Um, Definitely a necessary job. <laughs> totally, <laughs> a lot to be done, but or or I hear you. Or uh, talent buyer though, I like that in house in house booking or talent buyer. I, mm. I like those. But. but you don't exclusively book one spot. You kind of you do your show and you partner with a venue or you partner with a, another yeah. promoter it's, or talent buyer. With the the movie house, the Tracy the movie house, it's kind of like. I'm doing most of the booking, so I, I kind of kind of rent their rent their venue. Then, uh, no, it's more of a partnership. Oh, okay. Uh, we have a, a partnership deal actually, and they're they're letting other people, you know, rent the space for you know different events. Like they're doing a comedy show uh, next week. Actually, you're not going to get all gangster and be like, no one else, just me. Well, I wanted to, <laughs> but right, I, let's start. Well, I don't know. Let's bring just, the bats out. Um. No, I'm I'm totally cool with anyone else trying to put on a show. You know, like <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I like that shade. <laughs> trying. I'm just kidding. Good luck, but, bro. Uh, no, uh, I don't know. I just have a. Uh, I've just made a deal with those guys, and they're pretty much gave me. You know, um, they just said run with it and see what you can do. You know, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. we have a deal, and uh, obviously anyone else wants to go rent the space for whatever they want to do they can do that too there's yeah. contact information all over the web but uh i have a lot of dates you know working on right now that so there's not a lot of room to do that but you know go ahead you know more the merrier. yeah well i saw you guys at the chuck we haven't mentioned the chuck yet the charleston for anybody out there looking uh for info but um that's been going strong for years it's been good um for what it is let's let's put it that way but um I've been I've honestly enjoyed seeing some shows there yeah. um, this year. It's been cool. So saw you guys there. Sounded good. I I wasn't surprised. I was I was glad. I was <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it wouldn't sound good. So I was just glad that it did. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. On. So I saw your well. It wasn't your first show. Maybe. No, it was. Was it your first it, show? Yeah. Yeah. At our, the Chuck. That was our first show. Oh, wow. Yes. At the right. Chuck. Well, in September. Yeah. Yeah. We played. Yeah. We just played there with Guttermouth too. Yeah. No, yeah. no, I saw I saw the one in sep- was it September? Yeah, you were, yeah, you were yeah. No, yeah. you did have a su- kind of surprised <laughs> reaction like, "Oh, well, that, well was, that was pretty good." Who knows yeah. what you're going to get? You got Lumpy on guitar. Um, you know, but I will say this about the Chuck, I think um Angel and Andy deserve a ton of credit yeah. for keeping an all ages punk club going. Agreed. And you know, same thing for people like Josh who were willing to go out on a limb and book these shows because you know there is no profit margin and it is a smaller town and and there's a lot of risk you know i mean it, mm-hmm. it seems easy enough to put a show together but there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into it and there's there financial <laughs> commitments and you know part of a scene sort of taking off is having some reliable options for clubs so yeah you got the manette that's our go-to bar the east side tavern for 30 years um, you've got the Chuck, you need an all ages punk club in town for it to really be sustainable. Um, like Josh was saying earlier, you know, you're starting to see some younger bands like sailing camp and AV heroes. And, you know, we're talking about back when we were younger, looking up to these guys and girls who were two and three years older than us. And back then that seemed like a, a, a big age difference. Um, but you know, it's cool because, we play these shows with these younger bands like Sailing Camp, and I'm listening to them, picking up some pointers, thinking, okay, okay, you know, these they got their own slant on this. And then at our last show um, with Guttermouth, I see uh, the guitar player from from Sailing Camp, Ryan, singing along to one of our songs, and I'm like, hey, that's that's really cool that you appreciated enough to learn the words and. That's what it's all about. I, you know, I just remember all these bands who I played that tape until it sounded like this. And you had to put two pencils in there and and (laughs) tighten it. Um, Memorizing every lyric, every beat, every riff, and just Mm -hmm. ingraining it in your soul for the rest of your life. And, you know, that's what it's all about. Um, People who are willing to uh, uh, create those opportunities, book the bands, keep the clubs going. I mean, the Chuck's what, 12 years in or something? Uh, It's pretty phenomenal. Most all ages clubs, most bars, most venues don't last anywhere near that long. So it's pretty 
rad that we have that in town. And like you, I've had a hell of a time uh, going to going there and checking out shows. So mm. I'm pretty grateful that they've kept it going all these years. Yeah, and I love the location. There's not enough stuff in West Bremerton, so like, just love that it's here. Um, yeah, I mean, the Chuck. We you know we've had. Was there a place in Port Orchard called J. A. Michaels? Or yeah. Am I crazy? Yeah, it wasn't. And that. there was kind of a bigger venue. It wasn't tiny. Yeah, it was like right on Bay Street on the water. Yeah, I went and to a show there. Who was it? Maybe it was Green 13 or something like that. It was that era. Yeah. Must have been. <laughs> I think I went to that also. But I think, um, <laughs> it's a so small it was, town, small world, man. <laughs> right there, like right on the right by the boat, the marina there. Yeah, yeah. it's right there. And it, they were doing like 21 up shows, but I think they kind of had an all ages section that you could, mm -hmm. you know, go stand in like, you know, the Chuck pretty much set up that way. But, uh, yeah, yeah I went to a couple down there too. And, uh, um, yeah, I mean, there was a few different uh, Port Orchard venues that we played, like all ages type things, um, but I can't even remember. Aside from the Sunny, I don't think we, MXPX never played Sunny Slope Grange, but we played some other some other um, type Grange thing out there with a band called Fast Orange. You remember Fast Orange? They yeah. must have been Port Orchard. They must have not like played over here often. Fast Orange, that's uh, Quint Andre. Was in Fast Orange. Nice memory. This guy is an encyclopedia. <laughs> His knowledge of local and national acts is ridiculous. He talks to me about bands, pulls them out of thin air. Like, how do I? How do you not know about this band? <laughs> um, so it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. But uh, yeah, and Pat, the drummer of uh, Fast Orange, he's in Circle Twerks and uh, all arts bands. I think. All arts, mask me. Okay. Mask me. See, that's the thing. It's like back then, we were just, I don't know, we'd play with a bunch of bands, but then we would I'd not see them again or something. So I never really knew who anybody was. I, I think I I mean, went, I knew who some people were, but. Went to a coffee place in Port Orchard to see you guys. New song. New song coffee house. Yeah. And yes. then, but then like, we didn't go in for some reason and left or whatever. But I remember going there five bucks that. screw that or whatever <laughs> <laughs> i mean that was a lot of money back then yeah, five yeah. bucks to no, get into I mean, a show you could buy a lot of like, beer with that and that's like what 20 bucks now maybe maybe even more well yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe even i don't more. even think it was the the, the 50 a, a, a money issue but uh it was just like something came up and we bailed or whatever but i remember that you guys being there yeah we played there a few times uh, yep yep um that was yeah that was that was like a decent venue um, Paulsbo though, I don't remember ever playing Paulsbo. Well, if you consider the Crystal Grange Paulsbo, it has a uh, Paulsbo address on it, but it's like never played there. More, Is that it's more Central, Central Valley? Kitsap. Yeah, you go out Central Valley and you take a right at the store and go down through the mm -hmm, little mm -hmm. farmland there, and there's this Grange Hall just sitting there. I know what you're saying. Well, um, I played I played T ball there when I was a little kid, so I, I knew where it was, but. I actually the other day I was just driving around and looking at every single hall that I've rented for a show in this county and there was like good probably twenty. Nice. Like all of them. Like every single hall you could rent in Kitsap, I put a show on it. That reminds me of <laughs> this I mean, you were talking about back in the day we just find a place, rent it, get a PA, rent it, you know, go to DJ's music, rent a PA. We did that, um, I don't remember why it was like, let's do a show. And, and it was, uh, well, we did it a bunch of times, but one of the times I remember it was na the natural gas building on Kitsap way. So above, um, so above like red app, you know, where red app yeah, is it's like on Kitsap across way. The street, right? So it's a, you, you go towards back towards Bremerton, not towards Silverdale back towards Bremerton. And it's on the right. Yeah. 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 And it's just this random natural gas building that has like an open space. And so we're like, let's do that. Let's just, let's rent it. Let's just say we're having like a birthday party or something. Wow. That's creative. I never would have thought of that. Yeah. Place. Yeah. So we did a show there. I mean, it's just weird. I mean, now that I think about it, it's like, that's a terrible place for a show. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, Josh uh, rented, was this early in the pandemic or midpoint, uh, the Jackson Hall, Boy Scout Hall and did a show there? Yeah. Like. Literally the day that the first case was announced in Kitsap County, I did a show there. 
Yeah. And, uh, really? That place is bad. I mean, <laughs> it never went anywhere. Never went anywhere. It's like, there. But. I was booking shows there in the mid 2000s also. I did like a David Bazan from Pedro the Lion. I did a David Bazan show there. Whoa. Which was crazy. By the way, he, random, random fact, he lived in. I guess technically Kingston for a while. Oh, really? Like if you go on the freeway and you go past Paul's way, Paul's bow and don't get off, it just starts like you're going through like farm. You go past the baseball fields. Yeah, yeah. And you're like farmlands. You go to the right and there's this giant like, it looks like a, a house out of like a fairy tale book. It's like super tall steeple kind of thing with like a, a t- you know, a tower. Yeah, yeah. Just a weird house. And so like he just like found it and bought it years ago, I mean so many years ago I think lived I there know for a while. exactly where that is actually. oh I'm sure you do I, I go on a lot of you know, little explorations and him that. and his whole band like not maybe his whole band but a couple of his band guys lived there for a while oh nice Kevin that, Kevin Bacon comes exactly. to mind yeah but uh, no that show was cool um, and I booked a bunch of other random like a Kane Hodder show there or mm-hmm. something and uh, Schoolyard Heroes Rocky Vadalato mm-hmm. that guy is but uh, yeah, he's great. Yeah, yeah Rocky's okay. awesome. And uh, yeah, it's like I said, I rented every single hall in this county for a show. <laughs> like, because they would constantly get shut down. Like, someone would complain, neighbors would, you know, mm-hmm. you know, houses next door would, it's too loud, these damn kids, blah, blah, blah. And I would go, I gotta go find a new place. And I just move on to the yeah. next empty hall. Yeah, there's never been like a place like Redmond Firehouse where, for those that don't know, it's just, it's kind of a community center type place, but it's it's an old firehouse co- converted into a community center venue. Yeah, yeah. Have you been there at all? Um, it's I've, great. I, I've seen really so many cool. pictures of shows there that I feel like I've been there, but I don't think I actually went there. Very, yeah. Oh well, going back go to ahead. going yeah. back to that uh, Sunny Slope Grain show, uh, the big fight. Yeah. Undertow was the headliner. And yes. They, they pull into the parking lot just as all hell's breaking loose. <laughs> Anyways, I saw those guys at the Redmond Firehouse okay. and just an all-out, hardcore, 90s, just karate practice, rager. <laughs> uh, Brainsick played there. So, uh, But when you were mentioning the Redmond Firehouse, it got me thinking of Silverdale, the Silverdale Community Center. Mm-hmm. They were doing some shows for a while, and they kind of had that Redmond Firehouse vibe. Yeah. Brainsick played. Played a show there, show or two there. Yes. Uh, the Sheridan and Bremerton. So, they, you know, they come in fits and starts. But, yeah, that's that's its own unique yeah. vibe. Silver, that Silverdale Community Center, um, MX Peaks played a, a bunch there. Kind of like when we were getting big, so we were, like, selling that place out. And I just remember it was just, it was a great place. I mean, the location, you couldn't get better. I mean, because oh. it's just right there in Silverdale. Everybody from the high school, because we went to, I went to CK. Did you go to CK? Yeah. High school. And then a lot of people from Olympic were right there. You probably were Olympic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to guess. CK a little bit too. Oh, okay. Okay. For a semester. I wasn't accepted. We, we did not. <laughs> we did not cross paths. No. But yeah, I, I just remember, you know, just doing really well there. Um, almost getting beat up in the parking lot. Um, a buddy of mine, I don't know which one it was, like started talking shit to, <laughs> to these guys driving by and they stopped and then, like, 10 guys got out of the car. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> like that clown car where yes. just kept coming. Like, what? Okay. Uh, and I had to, like, hey, he was just, he's just being, he's drunk. You know, like, you know, they they left, whatever. But yeah. uh, good times. Yeah, of, I, oh, go uh, ahead. Oh, I was going to say, a lot of testosterone back in those days. And uh, I'm grateful for a milder, more gentler version of the punk scene. There was a lot of brawls. Uh, it was a different time. And... Uh, I'm glad that part of it is is not as prevalent today as it was back then. Definitely. There was a little bit in like that, well, like I was saying when uh, I was doing a lot of those uh, metal core shows with the hardcore bands that kind of had a metal sound to them, and they had those, the whole karate gang would show up, you know, like the, the squads that had like a three-letter acronym gang name, you know, like mm-hmm. FSU or, the, yep. or the, the small Belfair version of the FSU that wanted to just come and like, they said they were like, you know, getting rid of Nazis or, you know, just wanted to express themselves how they wanted to. But a lot of them were really just there to beat up kids, you know, just mm-hmm. it was fun for them. They had that testosterone. They just wanted to fight. But I uh, had a couple run ins, had to had to put some people in their place a couple times and thrash them. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, nice. They, they learned their lesson. <laughs> if you've got energy or aggression, take it out in the pit. 
um, get it out of your system. Somebody falls down, pick them up, and there ain't no place for hate in Washington State. So feels good. <laughs> feels good to get your aggression out, man. I it does. It. You know, I live in the pit. I live in the pit. I when that kick drum starts going, I, the music takes me, and I just it's like a magnet. It pulls me in, and I live down there. And yeah. it is where my aggression and I, you know, I try to keep it friendly, but. For some of us, you know, some people hang out in the back, some people hang out on the sides, others of us live in that circle. I'm more of a observe the <laughs> band. Like, I don't know, I just like I like like I said, like I like learning new stuff to play on guitar. So I'm like just watching the guitar player most of the time, it's going like, "Oh, that's what he's doing to make that sound or whatever." Mm -hmm. And like, I'll go, "I'm going to go rip that riff off a little bit." I definitely love being inspired by going to shows, going to see a band execute they're whatever they're doing very well and, and it could be just you know it could be their playing it could be their transitions it could be the singing the front you know the front person um all of those things together usually but you know you know it's 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 funny you know when i think back about like say like perfect you know the silverdale community center um everything was just so new you know so like all these things are happening and, and it feels like it just bypassed you know and we didn't have the same things we have now to like document everything and so a lot of that stuff is just right up here in our yeah. in our memories which is okay you know it's like that's there's nothing wrong with that um i just wonder what it would be like if you know sometimes i watch a documentary i'm like how the heck do they have all this footage of this random thing I, I you was, know things I like that. that when uh someone was talking about that beatles documentary that just came out mm -hmm. on a podcast and i was like who had the hindsight to record that for posterity or whatever it was going to be? And like 50 years later, it gets released, you know, like, yeah, God, I wish I had that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Like if there was just fly on the wall in the Bremerton kids app scene, you know, back, you know, from, from our lifespan, at least, you know, I mean, it goes before that, of course, there's the Sonics, you know, think of like early, early. Yeah. Yeah. What are they like a '60s style punk rock surf rock yeah. band? Garage. Yeah, garage yeah. rock, garage all, band. Yeah. All of those things. Kinda. Mike Moen's favorite band. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Well, uh, so that uh, that is the thing about Kitsap, and it does go way beyond the those punk and garage origins. Uh, the Ventures have ties to Kitsap and Tacoma. Um, it goes all the way back to World War II when all the Navy um, personnel mm. were stationed here. You had Bing Crosby playing locally Lift. and the, yeah and then as the years progressed um you know ray charles was a regular here quincy jones obviously has really strong ties so we are reaping the benefits in this scene this uh you know commitment to music it started then and mm -hmm. those bloodlines have just continued um you know until this very day with like we talked about ebbs and flows and changes but it's still here and you know there's younger younger musicians coming up who are carrying the torch and bringing that different level of energy. And it's cool. It's really awesome. I love I, it. I had a chat with a older gentleman at the, the Goodwill um, record selection. We're looking through records at sure. Goodwill. And he was like talking about how he, or a Gene Vincent record was in there. He's an old rockabilly guy. And he's like, yeah, we went down to see Gene at a um, Pearl's, which became Natasha's in the, the early sixties or whatever it was. He's like, yeah, and this guy opened up for him with this red hair, and he was playing his piano, and he lit his piano on fire, and it was insane. It was Jerry Lee Lewis, and he played at Sheridan, or at, uh, Whoa, at yeah. Pearl's, you know? Yeah. And I was like, oh, what other shows do you see? He's like, oh, I saw Roy Orbison at the Sheridan Parks. I was like, what? And I looked it up. Yeah. Totally true. Like, looked in their, their concert archives. and Is that like somebody saying, like, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, yeah, I saw Justin Bieber and Taylor Swift, or, like, you know, it's... <laughs> well, you know, what we haven't talked about, too, is growing up in this area when grunge exploded. Right. Um, because I remember, you know, going to shows in Seattle and seeing Nirvana open up for Tree People and not knowing who they were. Um, and then just a couple of years later... Um, I want to say the first Lollapalooza show mm -hmm. at the fairgrounds and then Enfest not long after that. And, you know, it's funny, like at the time I was kind of resentful of grunge. I didn't like it as much. It was maybe an affront to punk and I've, I've warmed up to it a lot more through the years, 
But that groundswell of just people and the explosion of alternative underground music right here, a ferry ride away from where we lived to be, you know, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors in high school when that was happening was pretty mm-hmm. remarkable to have that going on in our backyard and in our own neighborhood too. Yeah, yeah. That was a, that was a part of it. Yeah, for sure. I remember the first time I heard Smells Like Teen Spirit, it was, I don't, see, this is where I don't quite, I, and I remember it this way every time. I've told this story before, but I don't really believe my memory because it doesn't make sense. I was at junior high, I was, uh, sorry, CK junior high. I was at the office and I was leaving the office for some reason, walking down the hallway to the left. And I see it like, you know, I, I was in those days, I was listening to so many eclectic things on my, my disc man or my walk man. Probably it was like cassettes at the time, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was listening to like the, the Eagles and like, you know, just random things. I was still into punk, but I, w- I was just into the Eagles for some reason, which is not very punk. But uh, I heard over the, the PA, this song. This is why I don't believe it because I'm like, how would it why be would playing? Why would they play that? Yeah, CK Junior High. Yeah, it, it was so big, it was huge. It was song. everywhere, and everywhere. I, and the first time I heard it, I thought, this is a weird Metallica song because <laughs> it's because his voice kind of had similar vibes as James Hetfield, but it, like, of course, the music's nothing like it. And yeah, I was just confused. And then later on, I found out who it was, and I was like, oh, oh, okay. I really, I mean, I love Nirvana. And that record is amazing, but that was my first just confused and and like just what is this? This is different. Yeah, totally. I I felt the same way about them, but my story of hearing them or about them is a little different. Um, speaking of Sunny Slope Grange, my stepbrother was really into underground music, which I didn't know what that was. I just thought he was like, I I didn't get it. I I was still listening to Huey Lewis and the News and you know, mm-hmm. Guns and Roses and some Metallica or whatever. And he comes home. Um, I was skateboarding out, snuck out at night, and I, I came home. He came home at the same time, and he had, he's like, I just came from Sunny Slope, Grange, in Gorst, and I saw this band called Nirvana. You should check them out. Here's their <laughs> their album. <laughs> called, it's called Bleach, and he gave me yeah. Bleach, and I uh, wore that out. And yeah. I, so, like, when they got famous... I was like, holy crap, that's that band that Rick saw in They played in Sunny Slope? Sunny How did Slope I not Ridge. know about this? this in like insane. 90. Wow. Yeah. In 89, 90. See, that that must have been like, that. 89 was right before I was knew anything about local music. Yeah. You know, I, I thought, okay, you have to be U2 and that's it, you know. And then there was that 91, like somewhere in there was like when I realized, oh, you can can do this you yeah know, it's meeting bad juju all that so yeah and they definitely were i mean 91 that's when nevermind came out so that's when the underground became the ground you yeah. know and uh everything just blew up from there all all underground the ground all. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm just the thinking of you as you tell as you're telling your story i'm thinking of you like back in the day with your backpack like huey lewis you know just like i still listen dun, to dun, huey lewis. Dun, dun, dun. i mean uh, I just, I think I talked about this on the last podcast. Uh, somebody asked for my vocal influences and my first vocal influence of all time was Huey Lewis. I mean, I grew up jamming. Maybe, maybe I Lewis. subconsciously pulled that up because I, I listened to your last podcast, but no, I was just listening to <laughs> Huey Lewis last week. Like, yeah, it's, he, someone he's, I know, good. Adam. he's so good, man. And he, and to hear him talk, I would love to have him on the podcast. I'm sure. He's busy, <laughs> but, uh, well, Chris DeMake, you guys got are him busy. On his, uh, podcast. Did he really? Yeah, that's yeah, right. I, I was very it. jealous. Very jealous. I'm I didn't sure listen to it. You could do it too. But uh, I mean, if Chris can, can't I? <laughs> I'm sure. Well, well, it's a challenge now. Um, yeah, send some emails. That means I have to actually try. All right. You guys were nice enough to spend your time, by the way. Thank you for, oh, you're for coming on. Appreciate it. Thank you. I super appreciate being here, getting to talk about all this with you. Absolutely. Where can people find your music? Where can they find you online? Because that's usually the easiest way to find people online. We got cassettes now, though, too. But uh, where you've got the yeah, Bandcamp. yeah, you, we're on all the streaming platforms. So I think you know Bandcamp is the obvious starting point. Mm-hmm. I think uh, you can find Radical Leftovers on Bandcamp, and we're on YouTube, and we're on all the other streaming platforms. We put out our. Um, 
our four song demo EP. It's called Demolition. And I, I tell people, um, if you love it, it's a release. And if you don't like it, it's just a demo. So, there you go. <laughs> that's why we called it Demolition. It's a win-win. Yeah, and it's weird today. Anything released is a release. I mean, you can't, I mean, you what you put out is a demo and I, I get that, but it's like, I'm listening to it as if I'm listening to it. I'm yeah, just yeah. listening to, you know, yeah. <laughs> but and you could still re-record those songs and put them on a record if you wanted to. Yeah. That's you, a, don't, you don't have to. That's a plan. Yeah. I, I like the, the, the rawness, just get the music out there. It doesn't sound bad. It sounds it, kind of yeah. how it should, right? Those like, guys did a amazing job for how quickly they recorded everything and how cheap it was. Like mm -hmm, it came mm -hmm. out like, Oh, like, rocking it on the, the car stereo, I'm like, man, we sound like a real band. Yeah. That was fucking cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it was great. 321 uh, Studios, Andy Fitz and Kyle Boletto, local mu musician guys with a basement studio. We got a new band where we're trying new things. I'm playing guitar, uh, bass, Lumpy's playing guitar, so it was perfect. Go in yeah. there, lay down some tracks, knock the rust off, and I'm, I'm with you. Like, that's the thing about... Radical Leftovers, and, you know, even Brain Sick, I, like, the whole idea was just, you know, in the pocket, skate punk, you know, two-minute songs, don't overthink it, have fun. If it's a little raw and unrefined, that's good, because mm -hmm. so are we. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think people latch on to that, and, and it's so easy to make, and I've said this a lot on the podcast, it's so easy to make things perfect. You can just, like, replace all the drums, and, like, and that's fine if you can really do it, but, like, to do it cheaply, it just sounds bad. And I, I'd rather listen to music that's just real, especially when it's punk music. If it's pop or whatever, it's like, whatever. But when it's rock and roll and it's people in a room, there's not, it just sounds cool when it sounds real yeah, to me. I agree. That's my opinion. I mean, I mean, we can go uh, off either way with that. Um, I, I do agree with you, but you know, you still want it to sound good and mm. not, uh, you know, like, I know, but that's what I'm saying like is the, it doesn't actually even sound good when people fake it so much to it. It's like, it's that's not what you sound like. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to go overboard. Yeah. But, yeah. but there are, yeah, there's tools. You can you can do some things. Yeah, yeah. You can adjust. But, <laughs> yeah, keep, keep it simple. Don't get in your own way. You know, our set, uh, I kind of conceived our set to be like an episode of Three's Company. 22, 24 minutes, you know, in and out. Uh, I bill us as the Pacific Northwest's premier opening act. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Radical leftovers, everybody. Um, Sean Devine, Josh Kennedy. Thanks for doing it. Thank thanks for having us. Cool. Word. Awesome. Good. That was great. It was fun. Thank you. Super fun. That was really fun. I enjoyed just talking shit about <laughs> good, the it's fun shit about my memories favorite, in Bremerton. favorite thing to do is just like shoot the shit about this stuff. Yeah. Like, I was just out at uh, the new to you in Port Orchard, that junk store by the Goodwill there, and ran into this dude, Roland Nutella, who, who <laughs> plays in uh, this band called Rain Devil. And they're kind of like, you know, they're trying to be, you know, like, they, they sound kind of like new metal, you know, disturbed and mm -hmm. that whole Godsmack era kind of thing. But, uh, like, we he went to school with James Honeycutt and freaking um, grew up with all those Port Orchard, you know, musician guys. And uh, so... We just sat there for an hour before I came here and talked about all his experience growing up over there playing music, mm -hmm. you know. So, and I was like happy to do it because it's just I'm more more knowledge, more stories, you know. I just, that's just what I love. You know, like, so, yeah, there's a lot of ground you can cover. Like I I brought this. What is that? This yeah. is book your own fucking life. Oh right. So when Brainsick was touring, this is what we were using to book our tours. And so you know, going back to how we met Teenage Bottle Rocket. And I was trying to remember, how did we end up at Ray and Brandon's house having dinner with their parents on our night off in Laramie before playing in Casper, Wyoming? And, mm. you know, so I'm flipping through here, and they're not in here, but the Lillingtons are. So, you know, Cody, from yeah. his original band, the Lillingtons, this is the 1996 edition of Book Your Own Fucking Life. <laughs> um, and, you know, in those days, there were no cell phones. Um, there was no internet. We booked the whole thing on an MCI calling card using book your own life and people like we were talking about who are going out on a limb to, to make zines, to mm -hmm. get venues going. And you just flip through the book, you draw, you know, you draw a circle around the country of where you want to go and you start making phone calls and see 
who answers. Yeah. And you hop in a van that has no business going down the street, let alone across the country with <laughs> pocket yeah. change and nothing but hope and see what happens. And that's how we met. That's how we met Ray and Brandon was uh, on tour. And, you know, um, when it was their turn to hit the road, um, we had them up in Bellingham. And, you know, here we yeah. are. Here we are all these years later. Yeah, that's actually, amazing. That's like all the first shows I booked came from the online version of that. Okay. Bookyourownfuckinglife.org. Right. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was like, you just signed up with your little profile and you're like, hey, I put on shows in this little fucking town. Come play. And like, so all these bands that ended up being huge that I booked when in, in their infancy, like came through that. The other thing was like the Bible. You that's know? a huge tool. I mean, yeah. I never used it, but I always knew about it. Yeah. And when Tumble Down around, well, 2007, we started Tumble Down. Um, I had a booking agent. I mean, I started I started booking my own shows at first. So the first couple tours I booked myself. I didn't use that. I just like cold called and emailed, mostly emailed, yeah, yeah. emailed people. But um, that would have came in handy, I'm yeah. sure. That would have been much, much better. Yeah. Yeah, having it all in one place. Um, but yeah, that's what how it's different these days. It's, you know, there's internet, there's booking agents, there's, you know, there, there was all that stuff back then too, but this was just like quintessential. This is maximum rock and roll. It was yeah. the essence of DIY or die. You know, if, if you weren't doing it yourself, you were a poser. And it's, <laughs> um, it's not that we were, you know, subscribing to that. It was, we didn't have, ha we didn't know how else to do it. Right. You just we, do whatever you can. Yeah. So, yeah. yep. There it is. All right. Well, that's the real ending. <laughs> we'll keep we'll keep that cool <laughs> i love it thank you guys appreciate it yeah for sure thank you all right see y'all always down to chat that's good is there another ending <laughs> <laughs>